everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. We're so excited that we can all come together when we're so far apart. Um, if you haven't gotten onto our website lately, I recommend you jumping on there. We have a lot of new presentations on that we keep adding daily. So if you haven't gotten on there, please jump on there. I will add the link here at the end of the presentation into the chat feature. Um, if you come up with questions during this presentation, you are muted and you, um, we cannot see you. You can only see us and hear us. So please either use the chat feature or the question and answer feature here in Zoom to send in your questions. I will share those questions with John at the end of the presentation and he'll answer them. If we can't get to all of the, the questions by the end of the time is up, then I will send them to John to answer and we will get them out to everybody. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will send out a survey here in Zoom for you to answer. It's just 10 questions, so feel free to um, just take a moment to answer that for us so we know how we're doing. Um, and I would like to turn it over to John now. He's going to teach on when the, the dye is wrong, wrong dye varieties that can be found and collected. Enjoy. Big, long title. So a uh, little bit about myself, just so we can get all acquainted. Um, I've been collecting since 1981. Uh, I fell in love with varieties in the mid-90s, and uh, I have built a good collection of variety errors, varieties and errors. Uh, I'm a state representative for the ANA. I'm a state representative for uh, an error club called Conecco. So um, I've done this for quite a while. I've given presentations. So we're going to go ahead and start. And uh, like Brianna said, if you have any questions, just send them to her and we'll see if we can't get them answered for you. Okay, so when the dye is wrong, wrong dye varieties that can be found and collected. Um, the first wrong dye variety that I found out about was in 2001, the white AMs. And since then, I have collected many, many, many varieties. Um, while at that, I've had to read books. So these are some of the books that I've actually used to gather information. Uh, there's quite a few books that, that can be gotten out there for each specific type of coin. And these books are also available for you a a members onto the uh, a a library. However, at the present time, the a a library is not open due to COVID. But as soon as the ANA gets back in operation, you'll be able to, to contact the ANA library and borrow any of these books, any of them that can help you out. There's quite a few there. So we're going to start with some definitions. The first definition is a wrong design die coin. That's a coin when the dies that struck the coin were not intended to be used together on that coin by the mint. So we're talking, for the most part, we're talking a circulation die striking a circulation coin on the obverse and a proof die striking the same circulation coin on the reverse and the proof die not polished. Some proof dies actually have a different design. This is your white AM since in 98 to 2000. So we'll talk about those in a little bit. Next up is transitional design die coin. These are coins that were struck by the die, by the mint, intended on the coin to be used the year before or the year after the year that the coin was struck. So we're looking at like maybe an 1859 Indian head cent, but the reverse having a die that was used in 1860. Usually when this happens, the mint's trying to find out if the if the metal will flow properly with the new design, and by accident, some of these coins get released in the circulation. There's not very many because it's usually just one die. So these coins are quite valuable. And the last one is a mid-year die change. This one is a denomination that in one year had at least two different designs that the mint intended to be used. Real easy example is the 1909 Indian and the 1909 Lincoln pennies. The Mint decided in the part of the way into the year to change the actual design. Um, a lot of these are known about and in the Red Book. I'll only touch on a few mid-year die design changes, but those that I do touch on will either have a value or you can see they'll be interesting in some other aspect. Some of the coins we're going to go over 
carry no extra value to a normal coin. It's just two designs. They were produced like 50-50. But it's good information to know, especially if you want to be a dealer or if you want to set up and sell to some friends. It's good information to know because it can help you, instead of selling one coin, you can sell two coins and it can help. So first up, my favorite, the fascinating scent. We're gonna start off with Flying Eagles. 1857, obverse die of 1856. Now, if anyone out there knows about scents, you know that the 1856 Flying Eagle is a very hard scent to find and very expensive. And for most people, they'll probably never own one. However, when the mint was making the dyes in 1856, they actually didn't put dates on them. They just made them up and then they struck them. Some of the dyes had dates and they struck them. Some of the dyes did not have dates and they held them. When they actually decided to make them for circulation in 1857, they just picked up the dyes and they said, okay, let's put on the 57. So they stamped on the 1857. Well, at the same time, the mint director sat there and, and did not like some of those shapes of the letters. And he, he contacted and said, you know what, let's change the shapes of the letters. And there's a few letters in the list that actually change, but the one that most people look at is the O in of. If you look at the center of the O in the top picture, it's kind of rectangle in shape. The inside of the O is rectangled. The A and the M actually are slightly separated. There's a, there's a real thin separation between the two letters. And the point of the middle of the M is kind of bulbous or squared off. The E and the F, the middle sections actually go all the way to the top and actually touch the top of the E. Now, the bottom picture is also my coin, but it's you know a very low grade. But you can even see in that one, the M center is pointed. The O is oval instead of rectangle. The top of the middle section of the E does not touch the top of the E. Even in the low grade, you can tell. So even in the low grade, you can tell that you have an 1857 obverse of 1856. Now this coin, has a value in the conditions you see on my screen of like $30, $40 versus $20, $30. So not a big difference. But in the higher grades, it does command about $100, $150 difference. But where this is really important is if you're setting up at a coin show and you got out there in 1857, you got three 1857 cents Someone might come up and go, I want to buy the best one. And they're going to buy one. And somebody else might come up and say, I need one, but I need a cheap one. They're going to buy the second one. And your third one's going to sit there maybe forever. If you actually list it as an 1857 reverse, sorry, obverse of 1856, you might get that first person go, you know what? I didn't know about this. I need them both. You might have to explain it to them what the difference is but they may buy both coins from you. So you end up getting double the sale. And it's a very neat, this is one of my top two, um, top three uh, design changes that I really enjoy. I, it's, to own a, a coin that was struck by a die that should have been used in 1856 is something that not a lot of people can do. I've, I've held a real 1856 in my hand and got to examine it, but I don't probably think I'll ever buy an 1856. The next one can be important for both verifying that a coin is real and something that not very many people know about. And it's the 1909 Lincoln Penny. So the 1909 Lincoln Penny has a reverse of 09 and a reverse of 10, but most people know about the VDB and the non-VDB. But if you look at the N and United, you'll notice that the diagonal cuts, they're kind of shallow and the N is kind of bulky. 
This design is in the 909P VDB, the 909S VDB, the 909 plane, and the 909S plane. Right below it, you see a reverse of 1910. Now, if you look at the end, those cuts are really deep, and it's very bold cuts. Those cuts are the same way on the letter M and on other ends on the reverse. But most people look at the N in United because it's very, very bold. The reverse of 1910 only shows up on 1909 PVDBs, the 1909 planes, and the 1909 S planes. The SVDB only appears on a reverse of 09. Just this week, I had a member of one of the Facebook pages that I'm on say he had a 1909 SVDB. I sat there and, you know, everybody's looking at it and they're like, I don't think it's real. It, it might be counterfeit or cast, struck. I said, let me see the reverse. He showed the reverse and I'm like, 1000%, it's not a 1909 SVDB because it's a reverse of 1910. It's the first place I look when I handle an SVDB because it's real easy. You don't have to go, is the field dimply? Could this be a cast? Is it a counterfeit? Let me look at the, the mint mark. Let me look at the S. Is the S in the right position? Is it the right shape? I just flip it on the back and look at the end. Now, this doesn't mean that I will catch a fake or a real, but it's the first thing I look at. Then I look at the VDB, then I look at the S mint mark, and then I look at the field, and I do all my diagnostics to make sure that it's an actual SVDB. But with that being the first place, it's really easy to look at. And again, if you happen to have four 1909P VDBs and they're all about the same condition, you look and you find out you got a couple of 09s and a couple of reverse of 10s, you can put them on the two by two and you can actually possibly get more sales because people will go, I've never heard of a 1909 reverse of 1910. These coins that I'm showing you can be found by Googling, most of them are on the Kaneka website, Variety Vista. You can find them listed in books. So you, you can get this information out there. I've just spent quite a long time trying to gather all this information. So the next one are the three reverse designs that will show our WAMs and CAMs. For those of you not knowing what a WAM or CAM is, that stands for wide AM or close AM. On our memorial pennies from 86 to 88, we had a reverse design variety 05. Now, most people just call it an RDV 005 or variety 5 is what I call it. But if you look at the AME, the M is centered between the A and the E. If you look at the TAT of state, the A is centered between the two Ts. But if you look at the FG, that FG is kind of weak, it's kind of mushy, and the G is kind of plain, it's not fancy, it, it has no extra oomph. But the very next coin is the 1989 reverse, or 1989 to 1992, also a white AM. So the M is centered between the A and the E. The A is centered between the two T's. But that FG is very bold, and the G is fancy. It's got a horizontal line in and a vertical line down below the curve. This is important because there are some 1988 pennies that actually have the reverse of 89. But because both of them are wide AMs, sometimes they're listed as a wham whether they have the reverse of 89 or not. This is very important because PCGS does list these coins as white AMs. Problem is sometimes they're a normal variety five and not the rare variety six. Lastly is your RDV seven, done from 1993 to 2008, 
and it's a close AM. If you look at the AME, the M is closer to the A than the E. The A is closer to the second T than the first T. And then My wife handed me a note about the cats. I'm sorry. Anyways, the A is closer to the second T than the first T. And if you look at the very bottom, the G's gone back to being kind of plain, but it's bold. Where this happens is in 1993, they changed it, and all 93s, both circulation and proof, P, D, and S, or close to AMs. In 94, they decided, you know what? The boldness of the wide AM is better on a proof coin than on a circulation coin. So from 94 to 2008, all coins are, for circulation, close AMs. For proofs, they're wide AMs. So we sit there and we look at this and, and we go, well, what does all this mean? Well, for whams and cams, rarity and dollars. So on the list, the first wham or cam is a 1992 P close AM. This is a 1992 coin that has a reverse of 1993. It has reverse die seven. PCGS currently has mint state examples of 12. And an MS65 price is $12,500 for a normal 1992 close AM coin. However, the next one, the 1992D, now our mint state total has gone up, but our price has gone down. The more coins there are in existence, slightly lower the price. And this happens all the way through. So it's an $8,000 coin. Imagine picking up a 1992 D penny and looking at it and finding the close AM. The 92 D that I own, close AM, was found in a retirement community not far from my home in Florida. Denver coins usually circulate on the west side of the Mississippi. So that coin traveled quite a bit to get here. And I really enjoy that coin. Next up is the 88 D wide AM. It's got the reverse of 06. This is the 88 that has that really flared up G. It's $650. Next is the 88P. You notice the mint state examples are slightly skewed, but the price drops again, 475. I believe, trying to find an 88D myself, that uh, the PCGS totals may include the 88D with a reverse of 88, which is an RDV5, and the mint state totals may be skewed slightly. Then a proof coin shows up, but it has a circulation reverse. So the 1998S proof, $360. Now we're looking at the 99P wide AM, 275. The 99S close AM, 175, the 98 wide AM, 100, and lastly, your 2000 wide AM for 40 bucks. 2000 wide AM was first reported in January of 2001 in Coin World, and that's the coin that got me started on all this. But let's say you went to a show and you found uh, some folders, Whitman folders, and they were full of Lincoln pennies from 1959 to 2008. And you found that they had proofs from 1990 to 2008. And you said, how much for all this? And the guy tallies it up and says, I'll do $75. And you go, can you do 60 for me? And he goes, you know what? Okay, I'll sell it to you for 60. You sell for 60, you go home. They're all beautiful MS 64, 65 coins. And you find each one of these nine wide or close AM coins. You would have just made $23,000. And, you know, I'm not sure about you, but I surely would like to be able to buy my wife a new car without actually having to pay car payments. 
finding all those and then selling them would be astronomical. Now, you're probably not going to find all those. You may not even find one of those, but it's something to look for. So first, the 88 reverse of 89, called a wide AM. So we look at a standard 88 reverse die. Notice the shape of the G. Look at the top of the G. The top of the G almost goes all the way out to the end of the vertical line. PCDS lists MS64s as a dollar. Now look at the bottom one. It's a reverse of 89. Notice the shape of the G. The horizontal line in, the vertical line down below the curve. Look at the top of the G. It stops at the halfway point, maybe even a little before the halfway point of the vertical line. It's a reverse of dyed variety six. So if you look at the price difference, I would enjoy trying to find an 88P, and I have. And I've also found an 88D in circulation. Takes a lot of looking. It's not something you're going to find overnight, or it might be. But if you don't know about these varieties, you won't be able to look, nor would you be able to find. How many people touched my 1992P, sorry, 1992D close AM before it actually got to a collector in the retirement community that said, oh, wait, I think this is a rare coin. It could have been lost, could have been dropped in a sewer but it made it all the way there and it made it to my hands. Somebody had to look. So the 89 reverse of 88, is this a variety? And on eBay, there are people that are selling 1989 cents that say that they are reverse of 88. So first we're gonna look at the standard 89 reverse. Notice the top of the G, goes to that middle vertical bar. This is standard die six. Now, look at the second one. It's an 88. It goes to the top of the G, goes to the end of the vertical bar. This is a standard 05. This should be on a 1988 penny. Now, look at the bottom. That FG is bold. The top of the G goes to the middle of the vertical bar. This is a 1989 reverse, but I bought it off of eBay and the gentleman was selling it as an 89 with a reverse of 88. Most of those coins are only, they're selling them for two, three, five dollars. But I don't want you to accidentally buy a coin that has no real value over face value. So this coin, you can even see the slight dip below the vertical line dip below the curve of the vertical line. So don't be wrapped up in the first fangled, uh, I found a new wide AM, or I found a new close AM, or I found a new variety of quarter. Do a little bit of research. Find out what the difference is. So the 92 reverse of 93, this is the big one. Uh, it took me a long time before I got hold of my Philadelphia minted copy. The white AM reverse, common on all 92s. The M is centered between the A and the E, and the G is bold and fancy, and that FG is actually closer to the building. So white AM, the FG is closer to the memorial building. The bottom one is a close AM reverse, common on all 93 cents. It's a verse die seven, the M is closer to the A. I want to bring this up that I didn't bring up earlier. The M is closer to the A. Doesn't mean the M touches the A. They're not called touching AMs. They're called close AMs. There's still a little bit of space there. And if the die was actually over polished, the space could be bigger. But again, the M is closer to the A than the E, even with a space. It is not centered. You also notice on this one, this die, that the G is kind of plain and the FG is farther from the building. A lot of people go, oh, the FG is close to the building or the FG is far from the building. The only problem is if you don't have another coin to compare it to, you don't know what the dif difference in distance is between the building and the FG. 
So I always suggest that people get hold of a 1990 penny, 1994 penny. The 90 is going to be a wide AM. The 94 is going to be a close AM. If you got a 92, put it in the middle and compare. Find out which one it looks like. Oh, I forgot to say the price difference. $10,000 for a 1992 P. I mean, that can buy good down payment for a car. 4500 for a 92 D. That can buy one heck of a laptop computer gaming system. You know, you can sell it and use it to buy really nice Morgan dollars if you like Morgans. If you like barber coins, you can buy some nice barbers. So the 98, 99, 2000 wide AMs, these are where we first started to learn about these die varieties being used on wrong coins. With the 90, sorry, with the 2000, in 2001 it was reported. So again, a normal variety for that these coins, the M is closer to the A than the E. The FG is farther from the building and the G is plain. On the one that has a value above common, the M is center from the A and the E. The FG is closer to the building and the G is kind of bold. If you look at the prices, again, a dollar across the board or 65, 240, and 25. Now, a lot of people go, it's just a 2000 wide AM. It's circulated, so it's not really worth a whole lot. But if you happen to actually get one of these, find them in circulation, you can actually use them to trade off and get better coins that you need. Lastly, in this group, before we go on to nickels, is the 1998, 99, and 2000 per. I'm sorry, the 98S and the 99S proof close AMs. These are actual coins that are proof coins, can be found in proof sets, but they have circulation dies. The M is closer to the A than the E. The FG is farther from the building, and the G is kind of plain. I have personally gone to the fun show in Florida, and cherry pick these out of dealer stock. I bought a 98 proof set that had a close AM. It can be fun. So we're gonna look at real quick some 2000 white AM errors. And yeah, these varieties can fall into errors. The dies are there, the planchettes are there. It can happen. So the first one is a 2000 white AM that's broad struck and double struck. You can see the M is centered between the A and the E. The FG is a bold FG and the TAT, the A is centered between the two Ts. For the 2000 and P white AM that's off centered, you notice the A and the M just barely there. You can't be 100% sure. But if you look at the TAT, the A is centered between the two Ts. It is a wide AM, but part of the diagnostics are gone. And that's why I don't tell people, look at the A and the M and the E. I tell people, look at the A and the M, E, the TAT, and the FG. Gives you three spots to look at. This one was an eBay grouping that I did not actually make a bid on, and I wish I would have. The 97, 98, 99, and 2000 are partial brockages. If you look at the bottom left, the 2000 partial brockage, you can see part of the reverse as a brockage. And when you look at the reverse, you can see the M centered, the G bold, and the A centered. That is a wide AM. The person selling it did not know, and the person buying it possibly did not know either. I did send the person selling it an uh, email telling him to let the person buying it know that they actually bought a wide AM. I don't know if he ever did, but I hope that he did. Next up, the nickel. So this one is your first mid-year die change. 
1939, they decided to change the way the steps go. So they have a reverse of 38, which is a mushy step, and a reverse of 40, which are well-defined. If you look at the reverse of 40, you'll see the vertical lines at the end of the steps. And those vertical lines can be seen even in XF coins. Now, they do carry a difference in price between the two, and I believe the 1940 reverse is more valuable until you get in the high end of full steps. Because the reverse of 38 was kind of mushy, a full step example of the reverse of 38 is worth quite a bit more than a full step example of a reverse of 40. These are just neat to know about, they're neat to see, and if you have multiple copies of a 39D and you're trying to sell them, Listing them as a reverse of 38 and a reverse of 40 can actually help sell these coins. Next, 1972 reverse of 67. Is it real? So in February of 2016, there was an article in Coin World, and it talked about a 72 nickel with a reverse of 67. But does this exist? Well, the front door and windows are recessed on a 67 nickel. The, these design elements are raised on the 71 nickel. 72 follows that type. I've never seen them, and I've searched since 2016. Two Jefferson nickel experts that I know of, and I, at the time, talked to quite a bit, and I'm going to mess up Bernard's name, but Bernard Nagengasta and Richard Bosquet. Now, Richard lives in the state I live in. However, he's passed away, so I can't talk to him anymore, and I miss him. Um, but they've never seen him either, and, and these gentlemen wrote books that, you know, are in every nickel person's collection. So if they do exist, these would be transitional designs and they'd be quite valuable. The gentleman that wrote the Coin World article said that NGC had not certified any of these types. And if I ever found one and sent it to NGC and noted what it was, that it was a 72 reverse of 67, they would slab it as listed and make it the discovery coin. So this is something that I strongly suggest everybody go out and look for. So you can see on the 67, those doors and windows are actually cut into the die. But on the 71, they are raised up. The bottom pictures, I actually drew lines over the top of the design elements. And you can see the 71 has a slight diagonal sloping. And you can see the difference in the triangle above the front door. It's very important to to compare it to another coin. So if you find a 72 and you think that you really have a rare 67 die, get you a 68 and compare it. Because that die, the reverse of 71 didn't exist in 68. So you can actually tell the difference. Um, they also changed the railing around the dome and part of the dome, which got changed again in 77 and changed again in 82. So 1982 P and D reverse of 77. If you notice the 1977, all the lettering is almost on the rim and your dome to, memor uh, to the Monticello is actually kind of flat looking. It's not very well defined. And the, the railing is also kind of mushy. And you look at the bottom of the coin, it also has the lettering almost to the rim. You look at the reverse of 83, there's a space. And I like looking at the E and E pluribus unum. You can see the space and the non-space. And on the bottom, I look at the F of of. You can see the space and the non-space. The dome in 83 is also more defined, bolder, and the railings are bolder. Again, 
Not a lot of people know about these coins. Not a lot of people collect these coins. So what does it matter? Again, 1982, they didn't make mint sets. So mint state examples carry a little bit of a price. You got four 1982 P's in your little collection to sell. Nice to label them as reverse of 77 or reverse of 83. Might get you that extra sale. Next, the small and interesting coin, the dime. So in 1964, now remember, this is slightly after the big uproar of the 1960s small date and large date since. In 64, they found out there's a point in nine on the P, the D, and the proof. The die was changed early, so the point in nine, which had been the norm, is now the rarer of the two designs compared to the squared off tail of the nine. Because the dies change very early in the year, the nine is rarer. These point in nine dimes can be found if you do a little bit of searching, and they're not real hard to find. They don't really carry much of a premium. The proofs do carry a premium. And the important part of this is if you got a proof set with a proof pointed nine dime, I suggest you look at the half dollar. We'll go over that later. So in 68, they changed the proof die. So you see the flame of the torch is kind of flat and there. But in the reverse of 68, it's got two deep cuts. Two different designs can be spotted real easily, and there's no real big price difference. But again, if you happen to have a box and you got proof dimes and you got two or three 68s, take a look. The research I did showed 45% of the ones I looked at were reverse of 67. 55% were reverse of 68. But it can't hurt to look because you can list them and you might get more sales. But this also carries another reason, and it's the reason why we call it the reverse of 68. Because in 1969, 1970, and the 70D, they decided to use this die to strike circulation coins. Now, some people say it was a mistake. Some people say that they were testing it out. I believe they were testing it out. Because in 1971, both proof and circulation are the reverse of 68, and it carries on that way to later changes. Now, on a standard business strike, you got that flat flame, but on the proof style reverse, you got the two deep cuts. Now, the important part of this is because they were testing it, the 69s are rare. The 70Ds are not rare. I personally have held over 170D reverse of 68s in my hand. I've held over 170P reverse of 68s. I've held about 20 to 25 1969 reverses of 68. And when I was first trying to find one, I'm born in 69, I was looking at every 69 dime I could find. I couldn't find any. I went on eBay and I couldn't find any. And there was a 69 dime that was gold plated. And I said, <laughs> you know, let me look. And sure enough, it was a reverse of 68. And I bought it knowing that there's no big price difference because it's gold plated knowing that nobody else probably would want it unless they couldn't get a copy. But there are copies out there you can find. But I wanted it because I was born 69. And it's gold plated and it's a reverse of 68. These are my number one variety that I like to look at. I'll go on eBay. Last night I went on eBay and I found 1970Ds listed on eBay that were reverses of 68. Usually I'll send the owner a little message saying, hey, just to let you know your dot, your coin was struck by proof dies. And, you know, it carries a small premium. You might want to look into it. I usually direct them to a website so they can verify it. So they're not thinking that I'm a crazy guy sending them a message. They can be found on eBay, both the D's, the P's, and sorry, the 70 D's, the 70 P's, and the 69's. But look at the price difference. My gosh, a dollar for a dime or $300 for a dime. 
Last night, I believe I found a 1969 PCGS certified MS-65 that was reversed to 68. The picture was a little blurry. And the coin is valued or up for sale at 30 bucks. I, I, I almost want to contact the seller and go, hey, can you, can you send me a picture of the reverse, a clearer picture? Because I've got an MS-64, but not a 65. My 70D is an MS-65 that I found, and it's unattributed. So I paid like five bucks for it. It's a $100 coin. Now I also have some errors. The first one is the coolest one to me because it's perfect. It was off-centered struck, <clears throat> going up and down perfectly so you could read the date, see the non-mint mark, so it's Philadelphia, but flip it on the reverse and you can see the reverse of 68. If it had been to the right instead of straight up and down, you may not have gotten the date or you may not have gotten the zero. And without that zero, it could have been in 1971, and that reverse is normal for 1971. The bottom one is a 1970D reverse of 68 straight clip. That coin is in an annex holder. It's an AU, but it is a straight clip, and it is a reverse of 68. This one went at auction on eBay today at 11 o'clock. And I did not win it because I didn't bid enough money and I didn't go back to check the final price. But it is a PCGS improperly annealed planchette with a verse of 68. Very easily seen when you go on eBay and, and flip through the pictures. You could see the two deep cuts. That's why I love this reverse. It's not something that you got to get a magnifying glass out and look at the AME or the uh, leaf by the arrow tips, which we'll talk about shortly. It is just straight up, look at it. Oh, this has got two deep cuts. Now, I will tell you in advance, the 1970, the 1970D, reverse of 68, has no double dies. 70Ds that came out of mint sets, some of them are double dyed reverses. If you see a coin listed as a double die reverse, it will not be a reverse of 68. So if you're looking for the reverse of 68, don't even look at them. Now we're gonna to go to quarters. Remember that leaf above the arrow tip I was talking about? So quarters have a design called a type A. And then the letters progress from there above H. So 1956 and 1964 type B quarters are quarters that were struck with proof dies, but circulation coins. Look at the type A arrow picture. You see that leaf? It does not go above the arrow tips. If you look at, and it's hard to see in that picture, but all the leaves all the way around the reverse kind of fade right into the field. They're not bold. You don't see the point. They just kind of fade the leaves that would be near the L and the A in dollar fade right into the field and they don't actually touch the letters. The type A, E, and S, the E and the S almost touch. They're really, really close. But if you look at the type B, that leaf rises above the arrow tips. The E and the S has a space in between it. All your arrows or all your leaves are very pointed, very bold. They don't fade into the field. You can see them, they're right there. If you look at the price differences, 56 and 64s, 20 to $24 or 30 to 140. That $30 one, it's a 1959 because it can be found in um, mint sets. So if you got a 1959 mint set, this is a coin to look for. I wouldn't really cut my 59 mint set up to get it out but you can list your 59 mint set as including a type B quarter. Or if you were already cutting it up, check it, your 59 could be a type B. And it sure would be nice to have $140 for that, that coin. But 
It could be better. What most people don't know in our silver shortages is in 1964, the six dated quarters, nickels, dimes, pennies, halves, were struck all the way up through part of 1965. The 65s were struck up to part of 66, and the 66s were struck up to part of 67. Where that's important is Denver called up Philadelphia, hey, Philly, do me a favor, send me some reverse dies. Philly said, no problem. Get out the hub that we're using for the silver and the hub we're using for the clad because they had changed it. When they hubbed these out and created the dies, unfortunately, somebody at the mint took up a D punch and said, let me put the Denver mint mark on the back, but boom. And they did it on a clad die. They did it on a reverse of 65. Look at the price difference, 21 to $350. Now, the leaf does not rise above the arrow tip, but it is more pointed and more bold. All the leaves are pointed and bold, and those leaves touch the L in dollar and the A in dollar. Other thing to look at is the tail feathers. Look at the tail feathers below the arrows. Those tail feathers on a type A kind of flat and they fade right into the field. But on the type C, it is very bold. And you can even see the center vein in the feather. Type C's are extremely rare. I showed a price of MS64 at 350, but raw AU examples sell on eBay for $100. How many of us have gone to a dealer's store, coin shop, said, I'm looking for silver. He goes, I've got a pile of silver quarters. I'll sell them to you for silver value. $2.50, $3, 10 times face, whatever. I've actually gone through dealer stock of silver, junk silver, and found a 64D Type C quarter. Showed it to him and said, this is $100 on eBay, easy. And he said, oh my gosh, what else can you find? And it give, gave me open access to go through his inventory. And then when I found stuff that I needed, he was allowing me to buy them slightly over the price he had, but under the price that they were actually worth. Because he was getting what he wanted and a little more. I was getting a coin fairly cheap and I was having full access. I didn't have to worry about him going, hey, you've been here for two hours, you've been looking at the pennies, can you move on or buy something? It actually opened up a dialogue between both of us. Something that variety collectors sh should try to do with dealers. Then there's the 69D to 70D type H. This is an amazing quarter. That's not very publicized at all. PCGS doesn't even list them. And the 1969D MS62 is the only type H quarter on NGC's list. Now, if you look at the E and the S, there's a big space. Remember the type B with the big space? If you look at the leaf to the left of the arrow tips, it rises above the arrow tips. Remember that leaf on the type B? Look at the tail feathers. They're all bold, and you can see the center vein. And all your leaves are bold, and you can see the points. The point touches the L in dollar. It's kind of a hybrid between a type B and a type C. It's got designs of Bs, and it's got designs of Cs. Well, this is the die used for the proofs. Now, I personally have a 69D. That's mine on the screen. I have a 70D, but they're both circulated. I know of about three 69Ds that are uncirculated, and I know of a couple of 71s and 70s that are uncirculated. I've heard of 
72D type H that's uncirculated, but I've never seen it. I've never been able to examine it. This is a small subset that can be very easily searched for, can probably be found, but dealers don't like to bring them to coin shows because they're not worth anything. But as a rare type H, these coins fetch, when they do sell, $200 per coin, at least. Higher grades, higher values. So I would be amazed if somebody ever put together a complete collection of all four. Now, I used to email and talk to Alan Herbert, and he had type H's. And I've talked to a few other people that have type H's. But I've never been able to see a complete collection of all four together. Now we're going to look at half dollars. Um, just seeing what my time is. Okay, good. So we're probably going to finish a little early, so we'll be able to answer questions. So half dollars. 1956 proof type 1 and type 2. Most people that collect actual Franklin half dollars know of the type 1 and type 2 proofs. But I want to show them to you so you can actually see them. The type 1 has a flat eagle wing. And if you look, he's standing on a perching stick. And on his left side, there are four wing tips. That's very important. His beak is curved. On the bottom one is a type two. His beak is straight and flat. I, I say he, he was flying along and he ran into a wall and smashed his beak. It's kind of flat looking. Um, the wing is very defined. You can, you can see the wing, it's not flat. And there are only three wing tips to the left of that perching stick. Now, it was changed pretty early on and all circulations are type ones and all proofs after 56 are type twos. So the 56 type one proof is actually more valuable. It's rarer. Most of us know about those, but why does it, excuse me, why does it matter? Because in 58 and 59, they actually use the type two proof style reverse to strike circulation coins. Now, Walter Brain in his, his uh, encyclopedia listed about 70% of the 58s were type 1s, and 20% were 59s were type 1s. So conversely, 30% of the 58s are type 2s, and 80% of the 59s are type 2s. But nobody really recognizes these. They can be found with a little bit of searching. They're not really hard to find, and I don't honestly believe Walter Breen's numbers. I think it's closer to 60 and 40 and 40 and 60. Might even be 55 and 45. But they can be found. You'll notice a lot of times on eBay, if you start looking for 1959 uh, halves, people will list them as uh, proof style reverse. Buy it now. Only $5 more than a normal. The only problem is, most of the 59s are proof style reverse. It's actually the non-proof style reverse that is actually more rare. Even if you take my numbers of 55 and 45, it would be the type one in 59. Again, flat wing, four wing tips, curved beak, type one. Bold wing, three wing tips, flat beak, type two. Now, your right wing actually has a difference in the wing tips also, but I always just go by the left. But if I'm showing you this, it means, again, if you had four 1958s and three of them are type ones and one's a type two, you can list it as such, and you might be able to get more sales. You might be able to get somebody interested that isn't interested in varieties. Somebody just collecting half dollar, Franklin half dollars, might go, I didn't even know there's a difference. I just thought it was a Franklin half dollar. Where does this matter? Well, it matters for the next coin. The 59 double die reverse. It is a type two 
hubbed over a type one. When we make our dies, we take a hub, which is pushed out exactly like a coin, and we push it into a bar. And when we push it into that bar, the bar gets pushed down, so now the design is cut into the die, into that bar. Well, it's not deep enough, so they take the die out, they heat it up so the metal can get soft, and they do it a second time so it gets deep, sometimes a third or fourth time. However, with this coin, it was hubbed with a type 1 first, and then it got hubbed with a type 2. So let's look at it. Well, it's got a flat wing. That's a type 1. Uh, it's got three strong wing tips and kind of like a fourth wing tip, so still type 1. But look at the eagle's beak. It's flat. Well, that, that's a type 2. If you look on the other side, the bell hanger is doubled, the E is doubled, the dot before the E is doubled, and the U is doubled, and the L is doubled. This is a double die. The design type 2, some of the lettering and the bell hangers were slightly off to the design of the type 1. Look at the price. PCGS 64, $29. A double die, $90, three times the amount. And we all know with Franklin Haas, there's something called a full bell line based on how strong the strike was. Also based on contact marks. You want a full bell line, you got to have that separation all the way across. Well, if you look, I got an MS65 full bell line listed. As a normal coin, it's $85. As a double die, it's $400. So you're looking at more than a 400% increase. So why am I showing that to you? Because I actually went on eBay, found a PCGS 65 full bell line of 1959, bought it for $75 plus shipping, and it was a double die reverse. I could see it on the pictures. I could tell. It's not something that takes a lot. That wing, that eagle uh, beak, and the wing tips, very easy to tell. Something that I would look at every 1959. Uh, I actually bought one that is a double die reverse off of eBay so that I could give it out at my local coin club meeting, which right now is not happening due to COVID. I miss coin club meetings. I'm not sure how you guys feel. So next is a 64 proof accented hair. Now, I've got the backstory from the US Mint about Frank Gasparro creating the dies. So, Kennedy died in November of 63. They wanted to rush to get a coin struck to honor him, and they were looking at either the quarter or the half dollar, and they chose. They had his inaugural medals. They already kind of had the design, and they kind of modified them. They created dies. They struck the coins. They took the coins. Mr. Gasparro took the coins to Miami to show them to Jackie Kennedy. When she saw them, she didn't like the way John's hair looked. It's a little too accented, made up, too bold. And she said, can you change that? And Frank Gasparro said, sure, I can fix it. No problem. He went back and he fixed it. The unfortunate thing is they'd already made up the dies and they'd already given them to the proof shop. They'd already polished them and they were already in production. This is early in the year. Remember that. So on a standard die, the eye has four serifs. Two on the top, two on the bottom. On the accented hair proof die, there's two on the top and there's one on the bottom. The left serif is missing. The hub, it broke off the hub. So every die after that, that was hub with that hub, is missing that part. Then 
above the ear on a standard one, you could see curvature of the hair. But on the accident hair, it almost looks like a wishbone. There's curvature going both ways. That's the second way to tell that it's an accident hair. But remember I told you it was early in the year. The important part of that is so were the pointed nine proof dimes. So if you get a 64 proof set and you look at the dime and it's got a pointed nine, look at the half because it could be the accident hair half. Now if you look at the prices, you, again, you're looking at $25 for a proof 65. If it's got a slight cameo to it, it's 45. If it's a deep cameo, now you're talking 60 bucks. Anybody would like to find that in the proof set. However, if it's an accented hair, it starts out at 80. Cameos at 140 and deep cameos at $550. Now these accented hair are known for milk spots. The milk spots will reduce the value of the coin. So try to find one without a milk spot. I have found quite a few in dealer's inventory. I bought a couple. And then the last couple that I actually found, I went to the dealer and I said, hey, just to let you know, this is an accident hair. It's listed in the Red Book, Coin World. It can bring you extra money. And the dealer is like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I would think that you just buy it. I already have to. I, I don't need yours, but I appreciate it. The, the holy grail would be to find a 65, PCG a 65 graded deep cameo accented hair that nobody had attributed and buy that. You know, paying $60 and getting a $550 coin, kind of nice. Lastly, that we're going to talk about with varieties are dollar coins. So we got three of them. I know I'm going awful fast. So the 1972P Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3. Now, I actually had this past week, somebody on one of my Facebook groups post a court a dollar that was a proof style reverse. Sorry, it was a proof. And said, is this 1972 a Type 2? And a couple of people actually said, yes, it's a Type 2. Man, those are worth some money. You ought to look in the coin world and find the price. I chimed in, let me correct you. It's a 72S proof. All proofs are type twos. The rare and valuable one is a 72 Philadelphia with a type two reverse because it was struck with a proof die by accident. Now you have three different designs, but if you eliminate the proof, it's actually a type one and a type three. And the way to tell those or to sell all three, is the islands. That's the easiest way. So let's look at Florida and look at the islands below Florida. Now, if you look at the type one, the biggest island is far to the right of Florida. That is a type one. All the islands are raised. They are actually above the field. If you look at the 72 type three, look below Florida, you still have three islands, but the biggest one is almost below Florida and slightly to the left of Florida. Again, they are raised. But if you look at the type two, it's like one big island and it's not raised. That's not lifted off the field. It's actually cut into the field. It actually drops down below the field. And that's a way to tell if you got a 72 type two, type one or type three. Is to look at the island and see if it's raised and bumpy or if it's flat and cut into the earth. The shape of the earth is different. The shape of Florida is different. I believe the um, craters on the moon are slightly different, but it's usually the island that people look at. So the 79 near date or wide rim. Look at the space between the one and the rim. A lot of people call these near dates because the date looks nearer to the rim. However, if you look at the date that I have on the screen, 1979, and the actual bust of Susan B. Anthony slightly above it, the date doesn't move. 
It's the rim that moves. It is a wide rim or a narrow rim. People describe it as near date, far date. But they should be saying wide rim, near rim, narrow rim. So if you look at the thickness of the one and the space below the eye, below the one, if they are the same, then it is wide rim. If they are different, then it is a narrow rim. So you look at my two coins, you can see the thickness of the one is pretty darn close to the space between the one and the rim of the wide rim. And on the narrow, there's a lot of room there. There's also a lot of room below the nines and the seven. They're not quite as easy to see as that one. You can see that space below the one. You can also see the price differences. $15, $26, to $55 or $100. Now we're gonna go into a 2008 burnished Silver Eagle reverse of 07. Now, the um, design changed in 2008, was publicized in Coin World, and then somebody found an 08 burnish with a reverse of 07. And that was publicized in Coin World. So everybody says, look at the U. I'm going to show you something else. Look at the U, though. The U has a downward stroke on the right hand side, it's a reverse of 08. PCGS. SP70 is $300, but also look at the diagonal bottom of the N. It's flat. Now look at the reverse of 07. It no longer has that downward stroke of the U. The shape of the U is slightly different, but you might miss that. <clears throat> but the downward diagonal of the N is pointed. Between the downward stroke of the U and the point of the N, you should be able to tell this arm's distance away. There, there shouldn't be even a question. But a friend of mine in 2008 went to a coin show in Lakeland, Florida, traded off a raw 2008 burnish and a little bit of cash and bought an early release SP70 NGC Eagle, and when we got out of the car, I said, well, check it for a reverse of seven, and he didn't know what I was talking about. So we looked, and sure enough, it was a reverse of 07. He had traded off a raw with a little bit of cash, got an over $1,000 coin, and an early strike. Some people collect early strike holders. Some people don't really care. I don't really care. I want the coin, not the holder. But some people try to collect both. And I told him, I said, that's a score and a half, something to hold on to. So we're going to take a slight quiz. Now I know you can't answer me. I can't hear you. But it's something I do at my normal shows whenever I do a presentation. So... 2000, all these coins on each slide has something similar. So 2000 wide AM cent and a 79 wide rim dollar. The word wide is the same. You can see the prices. They're slightly different. They're above the normal coin because they are a variety. What is it? Is it a wrong design die? Is it a transitional design die? Or is it a mid-year die change? For the 2000 wide AM, well, that's a wrong design die. That is a proof die used to strike a circulating coin. It was not the die that Mint wanted to use. The 79 wide rim. What is it? Well, it's a mid-year design change. It's a change in the design part of the way through the year that the Mint intended to do. All 1980s are wide rim. So that gives you something to look at on that. Next up, the 92 reverse of 93 and the 69 reverse of 68. Both have reverse of and a date. So the first one, what is it? 
it's a transitional design. It is a 1992 coin that was struck with a 1993 die. The die, well, it's a wrong design because it was a proof die that struck a circulation coin. Last slide on this, type C quarter or type two dollar? Which one is it? It's a transitional. It's actually a 64 quarter struck with a 65 die and it's a wrong design. It's a circulation coin struck with a proof die. Now, the last little piece here that I'm gonna talk about for the, all those that stayed with me the whole time, which I know might have been kind of hard, is research that I've done on Roosevelt Dimes. Now, I'm telling you this, if you're a Kaneka member, I believe it's the November Aeroscope, we'll have a slight article about this. This is something I've gone over with a very few people, some specialists and a few friends. I've done a lot of research on this for the last few years. So trying to find wrong design dies, I started looking and I found that there were actually some coins that the reading's different. And it was meant that way back in the 1800s. Each, each mint made their own dies and made their own collars. But I found out that this happened in 2014, 2015 on our gold bullion. So I, while trying to do research on that, I stumbled across a 1981 article. Yes, 1981 in Coin World, where David Lang said that silver Roosevelt dimes have different read counts. Do what? They have a coarse read or a fine read, which happen to be 105 reads or 118 reads. Do they? Yes, they have both. So, I'm sorry. For silver Roosevelt dimes, there are actually two read counts. There's 105 read coarse or 118 read fine. They can be ID'd by the number of reads from the L to the Y in Liberty. I wouldn't want you to have to try to count all the way around because if you ran out of you sequence, you might be like, ah, I lost my count. However, if you take the L in Liberty and go to the Y in Liberty, you can actually tell the difference. The difference is 24 for a course read and 27 for a fine read. Now, if you look at my screen and look at the course read and you look at the L, the L points right up in between two reads. We'll take the read that is closer to the I and count that as one. One, two, three, four, it's right above the I. Five, six, seven, eight, it's at the end of the B. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, it's just before the R. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, it's at the middle of the T. 19, 20, it's at the start of the Y. 21, 22, 23, and 24, it's at the end of the Y. Now the fine reads, the L points right to a read. We'll count that as one. One, two, three, four, five. We're now at the middle of the I. Remember, four was the middle of the I. Five, six, seven, eight. We're about the middle of the B. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We're closer to the E than the R. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. We haven't even touched the T. 19, 20. Well, now we're on the T with a 20. 21, 22, 23. We're at the Y. 24, 25, 26, 27. We're at the end of the Y. There's actually two different read counts. Now I took these pictures, took a flashlight, took the flashlight apart, the curved um, area of the flashlight that the light reflects off of, put the dime in that, and I took my camera and took a picture straight down. It actually shows the reads or the edge of the coin going out. You can do this real well with your dollar coins and see the wording all the way around or do it with old half dollars that have uh, lettered edges. 
But what does this matter? So here is an Excel spreadsheet with 2,933 dimes that I counted. Yes, 2,933. Actually, it's 2,734. David Lane counted 199, and he came up with this information. He found, I want to say, six or eight year mints that had both reads. I've tallied on to that, and I believe minus 23 total that have the same year mint has both read counts. So if you look at them, I have a fine total, a course total, and a total for the year mint. Now, if you follow them all the way through, the last panel on the bottom are the totals of all fines, the totals of all, all courses, and the total of all totals. That fine number, 1,071, and the course number, 1,862, aren't too far off. But if you look, in 1964, there is almost 500 fines, and there's a little over 100 course. If you subtract just 1964 off, you'd have 500 fine totals and 1,700 course totals. There's way more course. And if you look at the list, there is a course read count for every year mint except in 57, 58, 59, and 60. For whatever reason, those four years, all Philadelphias are fine and all Denver's are coarse. I do not know why. I haven't been able to study it. I haven't gone... My plan was to go to the National Archives in Maryland and do some research on this. COVID, what can we say? Why? I don't know. But all Philadelphia's are fine and all Denver's are course, just for those four years. All the other years, there's a course for all the way across the board. Now, if you look, one that I haven't counted very many of is the 1950S. I've only counted nine, but there's five fines and four courses. So it's about 50%. Now, I could have been really lucky and found five fines, or it could truly be 50%. We don't know. But if you look down at the 52D, I've counted 80. 79 of them are course, and one is a fine. That one fine could very well be a rare type of variety, something that the world needs to know about and the world needs to look at. Could be, after a little more proving of this, could be that in one of the next future issues of Cherry Picker's Guide, that the 52D fine readed 118 read dime is a Cherry Picker's variety that actually carries some value. Again, there are a few others. The 48P, one out of 51 counted. The 56P, two course out of 57. That really leads me to believe that there's a very good possibility that the 57P, there is a course. The 58P, there's a course. 59P and the 60P, there are courses. I just didn't get a chance to find them, and I really would like your all's help to find them. Now, November, the Kineco Aeroscope magazine will have my article. Um, I am the librarian for Kineca, and if you need to get hold of me, you can get hold of me by contacting anybody in Kineca, and they can get hold of me. I would really like to know if somebody found any of the dimes that I have not found. I have a master list, and I have a travel list. I actually take a Whitman folder and modified it. And here it is. I actually took a three panel blank dated Whitman dime folder and another one, cut, the four, cut a panel off, taped it on so I have four panels. I split it down the center and I have coarse on one side, I have fine on the other side. I find this extremely fascinating that David Lane found out about it in 1981, 
kind of publicized it a little bit in the back of coin world. Nobody really has counted on it since. And I've done more research and I have found quite a few that are different. Now, it got me thinking why. So I went and I looked at, well, maybe Mercury dimes. And sure enough, from 1942 to 1945, they both of the read counts are there. Before 42, I didn't find any fine read counts. Now, I only counted 200 mercury dimes, so the numbers are not there. Very well may be that there are more. I've come up with two possibilities. Possibility one, when they went back and started recreating the proof dies, that they made special collars for the proof dies that got accidents in circulation coins. I've counted 20 proof of dimes, and all of them were the fine counts. So that's a possibility. I've counted clad dime reads, and I have not found any coarse counts in the clad dime reads. Remember, in 64, most of the reads were on the fine side. I think that's where the switchover began. Now, if you go to the U.S. Mint website, all the Mint website says that all dimes are 118 reads. Quarters are 119 reads. One read more, a whole lot bigger. But that's beside the point. The second possibility, and this one excites me more than the proof. In 1939 and in 42, we struck 10 centavos for the Dominican Republic. They have the exact same Diameter, fineness, weight as a standard mercury dime. And they all they carry the 118 read count. Could it be that when we got the um, issue to make the Dominican Republic 10 centavos a possibility? that they gave us the dies and the collars. They gave us the uh, galvano to make the dies and the cog that would make the collars. And either the collars or the collars we created and the cog got used on circulation and continue to be used. It's a possibility. And where that comes into is that later in the 40s, we also made 25 centavos and half pesos. So there very well could be Washington quarters with two read counts. Franklin halves with two read counts. Now, I haven't been able to go in and do the research for the, Rose, uh, for the Washington quarters and the Franklin halves, but it is a possibility. And you can be the ones that find that out. All it takes is a little bit of time to count. And trust me, I've had really weird looks from people that I work with who sit there in the break room with me and go, what are you doing? Uh, I'm counting the number of reads around the edge of a dime. Why? Well, because I want to. But you very well could find information that nobody else knows of. This is the end of my presentation. And as the end... All the coins you see on the screen, I've actually collected, including the die. They are all varieties, one way, shape, or form, wrong die varieties. And I hope you now know what they are and want to try to collect them, either as a small set, just the pennies, or all of them. And there's even more that I didn't go over. 1959 pennies with wheat reverses, which might be counterfeit. The Sacagawea of Washington mules, something to look forward to, try to get hold of, but very expensive. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brianna. Yeah, well, thank you, John, so much for sharing everything that you've learned so far. This was really, really interesting, and I'm hoping everybody that is on the presentation with us learned a lot. I'm now going to launch the poll. Um, if you could fill it out, it's just 10 questions, uh, super easy, all multiple choice. That'll help us with our future presentations. Um, so, John, some questions have come through, if you don't mind answering a few, since we still have some time. Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Um, let's see here. 
Isn't there a close 1992 AM that's pretty rare? Yes. So that's actually shown in the presentation. The 1992 close AM Philadelphia is extremely rare. I want to say like 12 uh, PCGS Mint State examples. Um, I, I have acquired one myself uh, off of an auction. I do have examples of all the coins that I showed you, except for the 56 two proofs of the half dollars that I got from a friend of mine. But uh, I, yes, there is a, a rare 1992 close AM. Again, the M is closer to the A than the E. That's the main spot to look at. Could still have a slight little gap, but the M has to be closer to the A than the E. Next. All right. Are these found in mint sets too? Some of the designs are found in mint sets. The, um, the, the main one that I can think of is the uh, 59 Type B quarter. That is found in mint sets. Uh, I've had reports that the 70D dime is found in mint sets along with the 70D double die reverse dime, but I have not proven that with a copy of my own in a mint set sealed. I have had quite a few people tell me, oh, I've got one that I took out of a mint set, but I've never had proof. But they can be found in mint sets, some of these designs. Um, somebody said they pulled out their 1959 mint set and it had a type B reverse. It says, thanks, John, I would have never known. So I thought I would share. Yeah, yeah. Those, those 59 mint sets, sure enough, a lot of them had the, the uh, proof style reverse quarters. And I, I, I strongly believe that's because when the proof style, when the proof dies started to get worn down, they cracked around the wings. So where you get the wings on the eagle, a lot of times you could see little cracks going down the wings. And I think they sat there and said, well, we can't use this for proof, but why can't we use it for a circulation? Throw it in the circulation. And I think they did that to the mint sets so that it was a nicer quality die, but not quite proof enough quality die. So yeah, the 59, I'm, I'm very happy you found one in your mint set. Uh, makes this talk all, all the more worthwhile. Do circulated variety examples have any value? Of course, some do. Like, you know, if you find a 1992P close AM penny, that is XF, you could still get probably 900 grand. Um, there are damaged examples that are detailed AUs that are selling for a grand. So very easily you can get a circulated example. Some of them don't carry as much of a premium as what you would hope for, but they can be found in circulation. They can be found as low as very good in the 1857 Flying Eagle and still carry a slight premium. Again, if you list it as this is one type of reverse, this is another type of reverse, you can actually get somebody to buy them both and you can get two sales out of it if you're a dealer. If you're a collector, it's awful fun just to go out and find them. Next. All right. Um, isn't the 1971D Ike from the Eagle also a proof for reverse? Okay, so the 71D Friendly Eagle. I didn't get a chance to cover that because I wasn't sure about my time frame. So what they did is, remember, they were new to striking clad coinage in 1971. So with this, they didn't get a chance to know all the tonnage and how the dice would hold up. Well, after striking a few in 1971, they said, you know what? These dies need to be modified. And when Frank Gasparro wanted to create the, the actual eagle, he wanted to create it as an angry eagle, not meaning angry like as in mad, but ferocious, fierce. The U.S. conquered the moon, not Russia. Well, the Mint didn't want them to have that. So they said, you know what? We'd rather you have a friendly design. Kind of nice. So Frank made the friendly design and some of the 71 Denver's were struck with the friendly design. 
the main pickup point on that coin is when the eagle is looking to the side, there's a frow over the top of his eye. If that frow is not there, then it's a friendly eagle. Some of the 71D friendly eagles can be identified. I believe there's also another diagnostic on the crater, but I'm not sure. I do have a 71D friendly eagle that I did acquire. Um, they do carry quite a bit of a value. A 71D AU would be, you know, a dollar, two bucks. A uh, friendly eagle would be 85 to to $100. Um, I wanted to put that in there. I do have the coin. I just wasn't sure about the time. So I didn't actually put it in there. I should have, and I'm sorry. But the 71D was actually a design change at the beginning of the year because of the way that the metal struck up and basically ate away at the dies. Dies got worn too fast, so they changed it. Next. How rare is a 1989D MS67 Congress Bicennial Half Dollar with a misaligned reverse? Okay, so that one isn't a design variety. It's the fact that when the dies go together, they're supposed to be, I'll try to do this, supposed to be top and the top of the reverse. Well, they have them sideways. I don't think they're 180. I think they're 90. I can't exactly remember. However, they are pretty rare, and they carry quite a bit of a premium. It's not a die variety difference. It's a die alignment difference. Um, I actually collect uh, two cent pieces that are rotated reverses or rotated dies. Very similar. The two cent pieces are kind of common. They can be found quite a bit, but I do have a two cent normal, a two cent 180, a two cent 90 one way, and two cent 90 the other way. So I call it north, south, east, west, the way the dies are lined up. Uh, Next. We would like to know where you're from. Ah, I'm originally from Tampa. I currently live in Ocala, Florida. I've been in Florida all my life. Um, I wore my hat the whole time. I, I was going to take it off. If you ever come to a Florida coin show and you see a, a short, kind of chubby guy walking around with a hat, that's probably me. I wear this hat to all the coin meetings, shows, clubs that I go to. But I'm from Florida originally. Uh, I do travel outside the state sometimes. I, I didn't bring it up earlier, but I would tell you, anybody that's interested in this information or any other information that Brianna is helping put on for you guys, please try to go out to the summer seminar. It's out in Colorado Springs. It does cost money to travel, costs money to be there, but you can apply for a scholarship. And the first time I applied for a scholarship, I got denied. I went back. I worked a little harder, answered questions better, actually contributed more to the coin collecting community. And I got a scholarship. And going there is so much fun. You meet so many people and get so much information that you just can't get on a normal setting. Even at a big coin show like the Fun Show or Long Beach or Central States, being at the, at the uh, summer seminar is so much fun. You get to eat together. You get to take a class together. You get to hang out after class. There are presentations. Every year I've gone, I've given a presentation. I've given similar to this one, um, and I've given some others. Uh, so much fun, so much to do, and such a good piece of information. If you enjoy it, you really should try out for a scholarship. But I'm from Florida. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, does it make sense to take apart mint sets to separate out the varieties? Okay. So that's a really good question. And you have to weigh what mint set you're talking about versus what variety you're talking about. So example, that 70D, I'm dying. I know there's a double die and I know it's in a mint set. You know, to sell an entire mint set, the first thing people go is, it's a 70 mint set. I don't need that. Well, it's got a double die reverse. Well, if I'm only buying it for the double die reverse, I only want that die. So 
1970 mint set might be more valuable to split it open, take the double die reverse dime, sell it off on eBay or at a coin show or a club meeting or something, and take the rest of the coins and plug them into my normal collection. But breaking apart a 59 mint set for a type B reverse quarter, type B reverse quarter, because they're in mint sets, they're a little more common than a 56 type B. And a 59 mint set is far rarer than a 70 mint set. So me personally, I would not break apart a 59 mint set for a type B quarter. Because I can go on eBay and find a type B quarter. But I would break apart a 70 mint set, and I have just to get the 70 double die reverse dime. So it all depends on the variety and the mint set. Can't hurt because you still have all the coins, but you're losing the mint set value. And some of those mint sets are valuable. Next. Um, somebody wanted to let you know they found a pointed nine dime and an accented hair half in their 64 proof set. There you go. See again. They're, they're, they were both struck early in the year and they both can be in the same proof set. So now you got a proof set with an accented hair, half dollar. So, you know, you got a, a good value incentive there, $60, $40, depending on if it's cameo, could be a whole lot more. And you got a point nine dime at the same time. So in this case, I'd leave that proof set as it is complete. And then if somebody wanted to buy an accent in here, you go, by the way, it's an accent in here. Plus, it's got a point in nine dime. So now instead of $60, I want 75. And you might actually get an extra money because it's got that point in nine. Now, me, myself, oh, what did I do with it? Sorry. I actually have my 64 proof set, point in nine and accent in here nine in a little holder. But if you were to leave them in the proof sets, you probably would get a better price for that one. And I'm glad you found a uh, accident error and a point in nine. Sometimes you only find the point in nines. Next. Um, it says, can you tell us about the bill in the screenshot? I'm assuming it means in this, uh, the end slide. Okay. So uh, that $1 bill in the screenshot is actually also a wrong design die bill. So, it is a Fort Worth struck bill, but the plates that make it up, the reverse plate is actually a Washington DC reverse plate. The size of the numbering, uh, I believe on the bottom right below the E in one, I believe that's where it is. It's the bottom right below the lettering. That number is a different size for Fort Worth and for Washington, D.C. That bill right there has a Fort Worth design. So on the front, on the bottom right, it says FW. And then on the back, it's got the number 295. The 1995 Fort Worth $1 bill with a reverse plate of 295 is actually a wrong design die. It's actually a coin that, or a bill, that was struck with Fort Worth plates and Washington DC plates. Um, originally, I had that in my first CD-ROM that I created, but then people were like, I really don't care about currency. You say it's wrong design dies on 20th century business strike coins. I'm looking at coins. I also had it the first time I did an exhibit. I had it in the exhibit and I got marked off by the exhibit judges. I've exhibited at the fun show an exhibit on wrong design die coins since 2012 and I've won at least third place every single year because it's something that people enjoy reading about and learning about. Next. All right, where on the net is all this info summarized? Oh, it's not. So uh, a big chunk of it is on Variety Vista, which is the, uh, 
It's the master list of die, double dies, repunch mint marks, and design varieties for Kineca. Um, but some of it isn't there. They don't carry uh, Flying Eagle scents. You got to go to Rick Snow's website to learn about the 1857 obverse of 1856. Um, John Wexler has a website on double dies, which talks about wrong design coins and transitional design coins. I've gathered this information off of probably two dozen websites and 20 books. There, uh, there's an actual, there's a website out there for um, Franklin Half Dollars. And that's where I learn about the 1959 double die reverse. Um, even though it's listed on the Connecta Variety Vistas, it's not listed as a type two hub over a type one hub. It's just listed as a double die. But once I found out that it was a two over a one hub, then I found out, well, this is like a type three. You know, you got a type one, type two, this is kind of like a type three. So I include it in my presentation so that people can see that there's actually more than just these varieties. Yes. Next. All right. Um, somebody asked about these slides. So this presentation is being recorded. So we're going to put it on our website probably in the next okay. week or so. Um, I did add the link to the chat box. It's going to be info.money.org slash e-learning. And then in that first paragraph, it shows the recorded ones. Click on that and you'll find this one as well as all the other recorded that we have right there for you. Um, they want to know, are you also a member of S? PMC. No, I am not a member of that. Uh, paper money. Um, I forgot what the initials are, but SPMC. I believe that's uh, paper money. Um, no, I am not a member of that. Uh, the memberships I hold is I am a state rep for the ANA and a member of ANA. I am a member of my local coin club, Ocala Coin Club and also the recording secretary. I am a member of Kineca. I'm a state representative for Kineca. I am a librarian for Kineca. And this year I'm running for a board seat at Kineca. Um, and then I'm also, I was a moderator for Lincoln Cent Forms, a website. And I go on back on there every now and then. I haven't been on in quite a while, but I am a, uh, uh, the wrong design die expert for Lincoln Cent Forms. But that's pretty much all the clubs that I can handle. Um, I have, uh, I, I work a 40 hour work week uh, shipping parts around the world. Um, it's not coin related, unfortunately. Um, my wife is a retired teacher who stays at home with her mom. And most of my spare time is spent helping out my wife and my mother-in-law. So I don't get a whole lot of time for coin clubs, but I do go online and I search dramatically for information. Next. Um, they wanna know if they can have your email. And if you say no, then I can give them my email and I can forward you the information. No, no problem. So uh, the email that I usually use is, uh, it's all one word. And it's spelled out. It's real easy. It is one cent nineteen oh nine at gmail.com. So O N E C E N T, the number one nine oh nine at gmail.com. And that being the first year of the Lincoln Penny. Perfect. I did put his email into the chat uh, box right now. So if you get it from there, you can get it from him. Okay. Um, Somebody mentioned for the um, acronym that you're trying to figure out was Society of Paper Money Collectors. There you go. I knew it was paper money. I just couldn't remember the, all of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do enjoy uh, currency. Uh, I, I, so my favorite quote that I've ever invented is the coins we collect have a value, but the information we collect is invaluable. You need information across a wide spectrum if you're going to actually collect numismatic items. So I do 
actually every now and then go to the paper money society for paper money collector and, and check on it. I, uh, but I'm not a member. I, uh, I do try to learn every day something about coins. You know, um, Facebook is, is alive and well with a lot of coin clubs. And uh, I go on there. I'm on like five or six on Facebook. And I'll sit there and look at them. And I'll learn something. Every single day I learn something. And that's the best thing about this hobby is even though your name might be Garrett or Wexler or Potter or anybody else, Brianna Victor, you can actually go online and learn something every single day. It may not be something that you're going to use or you're going to remember, but you can learn something. And that's what I want to do is I want to be able to, to show people these great types of coins so that they don't accidentally sell. Man, I, I fear the day that somebody emails me and says, I had a 92 P close AM and I accidentally sold it. And the guy that, that bought it from me, put it up for sale and got $5,000 for it. You know, I don't want that to happen to people. That's why I'll message people on eBay and let them know. Cause I don't want them taken advantage of, but at the same time, everybody's got access to this information. So you can find this out. It's just a lot of, lot of searching for it. Next. Are most of these in cherry pickers? Quite a few of them are in cherry pickers. Uh, believe it or not, the uh, uh, 58 and 59 half dollars were in cherry pickers, but they've been taken out. The type B's are, quarters are in cherry pickers, but there's not as much about them. The type H are not in cherry pickers anymore. They are a cherry picker listed item. If you take your cherry pickers book and you go to the very back, you will find that they're in the list. I've got my cherry pickers guide over there. They are in the list, but they're just not actually in picture form in the book anymore. A lot of that has to do with they only have so many pages that they can use. And after a while, they go, well, you know what? People have seen the type Bs for long enough. We'll just put one page and list it. And I believe usually at the front of the silver quarters, the Washington quarter section, they list the different design types, but it doesn't go into great detail in the dates. Some of the earlier cherry pickers did. Um, the uh, dimes that are reverse of 68, when the latest edition that is currently out of the Cherry Pickers um, Dime book, which covers dimes to commemoratives, I believe. When it came out, they had discovered the, des the, the design variety, but they didn't have a price because they didn't have enough information. Um, Ken Potter writes a book, uh, Found in Pocket Change, I think it is. Uh, I also have that up there. Um, it it was listed in that with actual prices. Since then, PCGS has listed it, and it's actually there. Um, another place to look for a lot of this information is PCGS. You can actually go on there, and let's just say you like collecting um, Franklin Half Dollars. You can go in there and look at population reports or prices, and you'll see – date mint mark and you'll see the little drop down box and you can drop it down and it'll expand out just that date and mint mark and you'll notice that there's the a lot of these that i'm listing are in there some of them are not but a lot of them are you'll be able to go in and find the 39 reverse of 38 reverse of 40 nickels without the drop down box um the 92 p close am without the drop down box but the Type B quarters, I believe you do have to use a drop down box. And then you can look at the pictures on coin facts from PCGS to actually see some of the differences. Next. All right, you got two questions left. Does it make okay. sense? 
it doesn't make sense to send a graded coin back to get it in an attributive. Okay, so I I have I have that problem myself. I have that that uh, full bell line uh, MS sixty five double die reverse Franklin half dollar is not attributed. So I'm keeping it for me. I have no real big plans of selling it. My wife knows that there are varieties in my set, and I keep a little note with it so that if something were to ever happen to me, she could pull it out and go, oh, there's a note. There's something special about this. And it tells her. I don't think I would send it back to get it attributed unless the difference in a raw or a certified non-attribute and a tribute was more than $100. Because you're looking at shipping there the attributing fee, reholdering, and shipping back. I wouldn't do it for less than a hundred dollar difference. So if you got, you know, a very good 1857 Flying Eagle, and it's a obverse of 1856, and you're looking at, you know, like 20 bucks difference, wouldn't make a, a sense. If you got a 1992 P close AM, it definitely wouldn't make sense to have it attributed. Um, without attributing, people will look at it and go, yeah, sure, it's a close AM. Yeah, right, like I believe it. Because it's not listed. But they don't realize that somebody's got to find it and actually tell PCGS to attribute it. So it all depends on the value. If it's more than $100 difference, then I would say yes. All right, last question. What are some of your Facebook sites called? Ah, Facebook sites. So um, the Facebook sites that I usually go on is um, if you type in face on Facebook, if you type in um, coins, errors, and varieties, um, there's like two or three on there. Uh, there's a Facebook for beginners that I like to go on because people will post up coins and not even know what they the coin is. And I like to help them and tell them, well, you know, that is uh, this double die or that is this type of error. Um, Facebook for coin collectors was a Facebook website that a friend of mine actually started. And I'm a moderator on it. There's not a lot of traffic on it. Um, but it's a nice site to go and, and check out on Facebook. Um, just type in on Facebook anything about coins and you can get an actual Facebook page. There are Facebook page on Franklin Half Dollars, I believe. So, you know, you can go on that and find somebody that just likes Franklin Half Dollars. Anything else? That was all of them. Um, if anybody comes up with any other questions, I did put uh, John's email into the chat so you can grab it there and send him an email. Uh, thank you, John, so much for your time today. And I think we can all agree you did a fantastic job. A lot of thank yous came in, so I'm, I'm agreeing with that. You did a great job, and we appreciate everything you've done. We're going to send you John a certificate of appreciation in the mail soon. Um, for those that are still watching, our next presentation that we have coming up is actually going to be next Monday. Um, August 3rd, the ultimate large die sent in typeset uh, with John Wright. That's going to be a money talk. So it's not going to be any different than this, just a different name for it. Um, so if you have any questions, again, please send them to John. Otherwise, thanks so much for being here with us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.